Hello and welcome to this video. Uh, today we're going to talk about a question I hear all the time. Do I need treatment? Welcome. Um, it's a very interesting question because of course what do I need treatment for? Um, what is my uh, distress that I'm having? Uh, and can I allow myself to reach out and actually get that treatment I need? So today I'm actually going to frame it around addiction and um, physical addiction versus psychological addiction. So it's a bit of a kind of a uncanny title, do I need treatment? But I think a lot of people, f a lot of times people are afraid to, to even start that dialogue internally uh, or absolutely too terrified or too shamed to start the dialogue externally. So today I wanna clear up some of the mis misconceptions around addiction, physical dependency, physical withdrawal versus psychological um, addiction. So the do I need treatment is a bit of a herring, but I think it's a good way to start the thinking around you know, uh, well, I've tried things on my own. I've tried to get, you know, the best results I can. Um, but maybe I need to, th if I could share with you uh, how more sy systemic the whole uh, disorder is, for example, with addiction, then maybe there will be a, um, a breath of fresh air that will give you a bit of chutzpah to be able to move you to a position where you can start the dialogue if it's something you need or if someone else is in, 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 in need of uh, assistance or help, uh, that you can start that dialogue with them as well. So today, uh, do I need treatment? But I always like to start off um, with an intention, a way to hold the session. And if you are asking this question or, or, or tiptoeing towards that question, you may not feel worthy, you may feel shameful, but I need to tell you that you are enough. Hold in your head, hold in your heart that you are enough. I am worthy, I am enough. Let it be your mantra. We are always worthy and we are always enough. Um, we get many messages growing up which tell us otherwise, um, but it's a ruse. They're not our messages. Uh, not our monkeys, not our circus. Your monkey and your circus is that you are enough and you are worthy. And if you need to take action to help um, restore yourself to a sense of some kind of normality, then, then so you should. So I'm going to kick off with talking about the two different types of physical kind of addiction. Um, and it's important that we, we uh, you really kind of tease apart physical addiction um, from psychological addiction. They are absolutely different. So uh, physical addiction affects any metabolic uh, body, anything that processes energy in any way or, or does any kind of chemical reactions in any way. Uh, I think it might e also exist in physics as a concept, but physical addiction is actually withdrawal, so, um, which happens every time we introduce something to the body or brain, uh, and then when you remove that substance, the body goes into withdrawal period. The body goes adapts to what you're putting into it or what has changed, and then if what has changed is removed, the body has, that has to then find stasis again. And it's a period where the brain and the body um, is, is quite stressed because it tries to regain this, this process of regaining stasis after you remove whatever that thing is that you've put in. This is what we refer to as physical addiction uh, in some ways because um, it actually should be called withdrawal. The packet of cigarettes shouldn't say, warning, nicotine is addictive. It should say, warning, nicotine has a really lousy withdrawal period. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a bit more honest, I think, because that's what's going on. So we can think about physical addiction as a period of withdrawal. And everything has it. There's different periods for different drugs or alcohol. or Everything has a different withdrawal period. And while you're going through that period, the body and the mind or the brain are very distressed. And they're in a lot of pain usually as well. Uh, and there's a lot of metabolic processes that are kind of telling you, hey, I need this substance or this thing back in my system because it hurts. <laughs> And it doesn't matter whether you have a psychological addiction or not, this will affect you. This affects every single man, woman, and child, and non-binary person, <laughs> not normally gender specific. It affects everyone, this affects everyone. Uh, animals um, across the board, across um, our vast genome uh, of all the species on this planet. If you put something in, the body adapts, you take it out, the body screams, simple as that. And we see it with lots of different things, uh, you know, and it's simple things like water. Uh, there's many ways where the body will and the brain will adapt quite readily. But then we see something interesting, because if I continue going through a process and I pull the bridge between my withdrawal periods closer and closer and closer, we see what is referred to as physical dependence. And this is actually when people say addiction, physical addiction, they actually really mean physical dependence, I think, because this is when... Um, you know, the chronic use of something, whatever it is that I've been putting in, the body is adapting, but the pain and the kind of distress from the withdrawal period, it kicks in so quickly that I really need to top it up back again. 
Um, and so we see with a chronic use of something uh, where the abrupt or gradual withdrawal causes a very unpleasant physical symptom. Of course it does, because you've seen in physical addiction or withdrawal that there is a physical um, uh, aspect to it. So there must be a constant topping up to avoid this systemic distress and pain that we feel. Uh, and then it becomes a daily grind. Then I'm simply just trying to keep this level elevated to where the body is not going to panic and send me kind of Morse code that says, warning, your life's in danger. Because that's what's really happening. The brain is kind of on fire. It really wants you to help it out. And so there's a huge amount of mobilization in psychology and in the body to try and find more of this thing because the body is in distress and the mind is in distress. And of course, once go one goes through a withdrawal period, once, been, once one's been through a withdrawal period, it's all smooth sailing. But in that period of the withdrawal, um, that's where things are very, very distressing for the body. And I think that's important to know. So there's a, there's a very specific criteria for physical dependency and physical addiction. And as you can see, I haven't mentioned the word psychology anywhere here. So then, you know, why would I talk about psychological addiction as well? What's going on there? So here, very simply, we see that if we have an incident, and this is any kind of, uh, let's call it a, a stress cycle, an interaction cycle, a moment to moment cycle, you can just find this, the moments or the ways to describe it in your own life. But if there's an incident that I have, for example, anything, I've got to have a difficult conversation with a boss. Maybe I have to have a conversation with my partner. Maybe I have to decide um, what I'm going to study. There could be lots of different things that happen, many incidents. What generally happens is there's two ways we can deal with this. We can either do nothing, which starts creating a massive amount of intrapsychic in the mind stress, a huge amount of anxiety. If you've watched the anxiety modules or, or, or sessions, you'll see that the probabilistic uncertainty, we don't like being put in this position. We don't like doing that. So generally, if it's an area where we have skills and where we have ability to, to move into a space, the skills to communicate, to say something, to express our needs, to express our, our desires, express our emotions, uh, and also if we have skills to make a plan, to schedule, to do, even the skills to kind of talk in a way that gets us results or is able to you know, foster a kind of understanding that people know what we're talking about, then we manage. So the incident happens uh, and then we manage. I've got to have a difficult conversation with the boss. It's fine. Um, I think about what I'm going to say. I go up to him and I say, hey, this is not working. This is working. It's not working. This, period, this position of doing nothing is not a place in our psychology, in the framework of our psychology, that is a comfortable place for us. So we avoid this. Of course, it can, we can eventually end up here, but that's not what it is. So where does psychological addiction fit in? Where does it fit in? Well, um, what if I can't manage? What if I can't manage? What if I can't do these things? And Dr. Lance Dodies, whose work I'm quoting quite a lot of today, and the book, The Heart of Addiction, I highly recommend. He says that virtually every time we flick a switch and we compulsively use a substance or alcohol or whatever it might be, is, is preceded. Virtually every time that happens, every time we reach out for a drug or a cigarette, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that, but if every time that happens psychologically, just before that, there's been a, a huge overwhelming sense of hopelessness or powerlessness. You know, I've been in that, in that workflow. I've kind of sat there and seen, oh, it's either do nothing or, and then I get this huge feeling of hopelessness. So if I can't have the conversation with my boss, I'm sitting there, I know I, I, know I need to have it. I don't want to not have it, and I'm feeling quite quite kind of unsettled by that. But in this very, very important moment, I flick a switch. And that's what he means here. Virtually every addictive act is preceded by a feeling of helplessness or powerlessness. And let's see how that works in this. So here we saw the same graph from before, the same flowchart. An incident happens, conversation with your spouse or partner or um, deciding to do something really important or having to meet a deadline or whatever it might be. Um, we will generally manage. We won't do nothing. Generally, we're going to try and manage that. But then what happens is if I've had a history of developmental trauma, maybe I don't have the skills, maybe I'm enmeshed in the relationship, maybe I don't know how to speak with my voice and express myself and let people know how I'm feeling, or maybe I just don't feel like I have the kind of support structure to do that, this generally comes from a history of developmental trauma um, or some kind of traumas along the way where we've been shown that the world does not kind of interact with us in a way that is safe. So if I don't think the world is safe, what chances do I have of being able to manage? Because I'm not, I don't really believe that managing is going to get me what I need. So this is where psychological addiction becomes a mechanic that the brain uses to try and usurp control. Um, and what it does is we see this flick, uh, the switch being flicked um, and psychological relief being taken. I don't manage the task at hand or the conversation or the expression or the need or the desire. I don't do nothing. 
but the brain doesn't like that paralysis. So I flick a switch and Dr. Lance Dodi's in his book, The Heart of Addiction, he calls it the key moment, which I'll talk about shortly. So we see that in this moment where I've had to kind of do something that I really wanted to do and manage, I don't feel like I can. And that kind of, that feet stuck in concrete, getting firmer and firmer, kind of drives my mind mad and unconsciously and compulsively, I flick a switch. <sighs> I'll just go get a drink. And you see this moment in all of psychological addiction. Now, what we're talking about here, I'm not talking about if you were in the physical dependence cycle or the physical withdrawal cycle. If you were in those cycles, this may not really apply. You may just be wanting a drink or wanting to do something purely because you're still, you know, your body is screaming at you. Hey, I'm trying to adapt. I, I need this stuff back in my system. This is different. Let's say you haven't had a drink for three weeks. So you've passed the withdrawal period for alcohol. Then you're sitting there and you have to have a very difficult conversation around perhaps your sex life, intimacy, um, you know, choice of schools for your kids. It could be conversations with your boss. It could be asking for a raise. It could be anything. But, you know, there's no withdrawal. There's no dependency at this point. But I sit there. I don't feel like I have the tools. And in this moment where I don't think the world can connect with me because of maybe developmental trauma. <sighs> and Dode says, Dodie's, excuse me, says all of his clients that he has had, and he's had many clients, feel better when they flick the switch. Not when they're drinking, not when the drugs come flowing. No, no, no. It's when they flick the switch. And this is why we refer to it as a psychological addiction. And we should actually be talking about it, addiction uh, in a way of compulsion. You know, this is why addiction is actually a compulsion. I feel compelled to rectify this internal distress that I'm feeling in this moment. So it happens largely unconsciously that I flick this switch. Um, and then, of course, once we flick the, flick the switch, we're just getting on a bus with no driver, right? <laughs> we just, oh, I'll get on this bus because that feels safe. Uh, it's not a great metaphor. But, you know, you're on a bus now. And, of course, if there's a history of physical dependency, you kind of, uh, you're getting onto a roller coaster. Because what happens is if I flick the switch often enough and I find myself leaning into that glass of wine instead of the very difficult thing that I just can't feel like I can do because I feel so stuck with it. If I do this often enough, I may visit that target, whatever it is, booze, drugs, it doesn't matter. You know, I visit that target often enough and eventually I start getting the withdrawal period more narrow, more narrow, more narrow, more narrow. And then eventually I end up with a physical dependency. And eventually I don't even need this cycle anymore because I go from a psychological addiction of that moment, the psychological compulsion, the switch that I flick, and then I head into um, maybe uh, a severe dependency. And this is how we see the, the, how, the, how it rolls out in terms of um, someone's life. And it is extremely distressing because it starts with an inability to have sense of agency and autonomy and speak my mind and say what I need to say and have conversations that are tough. And it ends up with someone just drinking alone in a hotel room uh, in complete disrepair and distress. And that's what we want to avoid. So why, so why I titled this, uh, this video, uh, Do I Need Treatment? W where am I in this process? You know, where am I in this process? And I'm going to get to some things um, in a moment. So we see that having this external object, and this is what Don's, Dr. Lance Doty says in his book, The Heart of Addiction, having complete control of an external object is a way of reestablishing personal power. My whole life is a mess, but screw it, at least I can get a drink. That I can do. That is something. And then that relationship becomes very, very reliable. You know, uh, in, the, in, the issue, in the issue of alcohol use disorder, a bottle of wine doesn't talk back. It doesn't call you names. It doesn't make you feel, well, it makes you feel very bad later, but it doesn't in that moment judge you. All it does is just sit there. And that is a very, very safe and reliable target when I'm flicking a switch. Difficult conversation with my partner. <sighs> screw it. You know, the thing about the targets of our addiction, so alcohol, um, drugs, whatever it may be, processes even, and I've spoken a lot about the physical aspects because often uh, addiction is seen as a physical issue, and it's a psychological one. I sit in a moment where I feel like I don't have any kind of power or control over my life, and I flick a switch to reassert power, but the target is very safe. Safe. <laughs> the target's very safe. It doesn't talk back. It doesn't, you know, it looks the same, smells the same, tastes the same, usually costs the same. The whole process is very, very reliable. Unlike this conversation I have to have with my partner or my boss or a big decision, that's very scary, especially if I've had a history of developmental trauma or adverse childhood experiences. So I hope that's helped a bit. I want to just talk quickly about, um, oh, sorry, just a recap on this. Yeah. So in that moment, I'm displacing um, uh, the hopelessness, that stuckness. I'm displacing it because I really wanted to do something else. 
but now I have a target that I can have complete control over and that really helps. So just to recap on the two points in Dr. Lawrence Dodie's work, there's the key moment where I flick that switch and if with enough, for, you know, a lot of people say to me, oh, Redo, well, you know, I, I don't know, I just, I, I'm just an addict, I'm an alcoholic, I just, I just drink. You know, we, in science, we, we don't do that. We don't just call someone a bad thing and you're just lousy and you're just kind of amor uh, immoral or, even to, or amoral. You, this is not how it works. There's always a flow and an ebb to how our unconscious and our life and our processes work. There is always a rhyme and a reason. Um, and it is our job in a clinical practice to understand how you got to a position that you did. That is our job. It's part of our work is to understand and help you understand and frame what was your key moment? When did you have to flick the switch? When did you start relying on wine as a, as a way to cope? When did that become entrenched? What were the situations? What were the relationships? Were there any milestone events? What traumas happened around you? There's a reason why you flick the switch. There's a reason why you push this big red button behind me. And it's done unconsciously, by the way. There's not something we like, okay, we go, oh, screw it, I'll have a glass of wine. But all the thoughts leading up to that are all very unconscious. And this is why it's called compulsion, really. Addiction is called compulsion, because I feel compelled to do it. Um, the other compulsive uh, issues, for example, if one has a, a compulsive issue to wash one's hands, you can say to the person, well, your hands are clean, but they continue to wash them. And in some ways, the same kind of traits, the same kind of characteristics follow kind of um, psychological addiction, where we just feel compelled to do it because there's no other way for us to, to cope. And then there's something else I want to say, because we said that if the psychological uh, um, addiction or the psychological compulsion lead can lead to a dependency because I keep reaching for that target, the glass of wine or whatever it might be over and over, and eventually my withdrawal periods get shorter and shorter and shorter, and eventually I'm sitting with a full-blown physical dependency. So now it started with a, a, a psychological addiction, it became a withdrawal period, and now I sit with a physical dependency. And this is when people really require as much support and help as they can, and it's usually the time that they are shamed the most. And this is devastating, because this is an apex point. This is an apex point in treatment where you can really help someone, because if they're in the physical dependency, there's a lot of behavioral, a lot of health issues, and you c they're clear to see, particularly with... Um, addictions that re revolve around uh, chemicals or, or things we put into our body. So there's the key moment. And then there's something else, uh, which Dr. Lance Doty speaks about in his book, The Heart of Addiction, which is on the bottom left there. Um, you know, you know so, so, okay, cool, right? so you flick the switch. Why not just go have one glass of wine? You know, why do you go thermonuclear like this behind me? Well, the reason is, of the level of self-inhibition, because I self-inhibit, I self-inhibit, I can't say the thing, I can't say the thing, I build up anger, I build up resentment, I build up fear, I build up all sorts of emotions, and when I finally do flick the switch, there is such a level of rage that comes out that I find myself compulsively diving into it. That's why some people, when they have onset of symptoms, otherwise called a relapse, which is a word I don't use, and I invite you to think about it as symptoms, when that happens, some people will say, well, I had, I had a small relapse or a slip or a, you know, and there's a reason because the more I've been withholding, the more pent up it is, the more I have inside that I've had to kind of feel hopeless about, the bigger their explosion. And that's, that's the second part. So there's the, the key moment and then there's the rage. So I want to kind of uh, end up just here talking about like, do I need treatment? A good question. The answer, if you're thinking it, is probably yes. Um, and I'm not saying that because you're a bad person. I'm saying that because you are worthy and you are enough. Um, if you're stuck in a physical dependence, you absolutely, like someone stuck with a high bacterial infection, at that point, it is now a physical game. You absolutely deserve and require medical attention. And that is usually inpatient care. Uh, and I'll get to the reason why. I mean, it might seem quite obvious. So we see, this is the cycle again, the incident manage, um, do nothing and psychological relief. And let's look at some of the areas here around interventions around addiction. So the first one I want to say is if I have a history of, of trauma and I have a, a struggle engaging with people or feeling a sense of esteem or I don't know how to say what I need to say because I self-inhibit because of old messages from, from the past, this is where trauma work and counseling and, and psychotherapy lie. And a large portion of the work ongoing will always be this. A large portion of the work ongoing will always be that regardless of how far you are in your recovery this will probably always be required in some way just to top up the whole time. But certainly, initially, a lot of this work will revolve around um, understanding why I feel so inhibited, why I can't, uh, why I, ha I act in this ascribed role of the helper or the, or the person who always wants to make people happy. Why can't I step out of that role and do what I need to do? Because to do what you need to do is the second part of treatment, which is to manage. 
I need to be able to actually have the conversations operationally. What mouth words do I use when I need to say these things? Maybe I've never been taught that. Who are my models growing up? What kind of messages did I receive? And what kind of social learning did I have about how to manage conflict? Uh, do I even walk towards it? Do I run away from it? And this has got to do with managing. So this is a large part of it. So we see a huge amount of psychotherapy, counseling, coaching skills in a supportive environment. But there's one last part we have to talk about because we spoke about the physical dependency and we spoke about psychological addiction. And these top two, these top two green ticks will help with psychological addiction. In that moment where I feel hopeless, I feel overwhelmed, I'm about to throw that switch. These, these two green ticks will go a long way to resolve a lot of those issues. But what if I'm stuck in a physical dependency? What if I've been down here for quite some time? Well, then one requires a long runway. And in other methodologies, they refer to this as sobriety. Um, I would agree with the word abstinence because abstinence means stay away from that thing because it's become physically dependent. You become dependent on it, just like a bad relationship, but it's got massive toxic effects both psychologically and physiologically, and it's, it's breaking you down, it's hurting you, uh, it's inhibiting your ability to, to move and cope in the world and to kind of maybe be even be aware. And so, so the long runway is basically a stretch of abstinence. And, you know, I am not naive uh, about um, how difficult addiction is to treat. So I always say generate a long highway, a runway <laughs> or a highway, <laughs> just as far as it can go. Maybe I should change it. Generate a long runway as far as you can, because if you're stuck in physical dependency, you're going to need to be away from that. So if I need, do I need treatment? If I'm stuck in physical dependency, I absolutely will need treatment because I need to be in a safe environment, supportive environment, a non-punitive environment. If you find a treatment center, please find one that is non-punitive, that doesn't treat you like a characteristic or uh, a verb, that doesn't treat you like an addict or an alcoholic. Find a treatment center that actually allows you to live and breathe as a human being with flaws and, and, and foibles and also massive um, amounts of, of beauty. You know, this is important because in mental health, uh, you know, uh, much like other medical areas, we, we want to fix the symptom, but the person isn't the symptom. So if you've become dependent on something, you aren't, you know, you aren't simply an addict. You are a multi-faceted uh, human being that requires love and attention and care and some reframing. And this can happen. So generating a long runway becomes really, really important. I hope that helps um, with my <laughs> kind of <laughs> clickbaity headline. Uh, all that's left for me to say is that you are, uh, you're tremendous. Uh, you're amazing. Uh, whatever failings and faults you have, whatever you've been through, it's all part of you. Um, if you make mistakes, apologize. Uh, if you do well, get validation. But above all, you are enough, you are worthy, uh, and you are beautiful. And I hope to see you in the next one.